An elderly black minister read the parable that was read today and gave a one-statement interpretation. Until you have stood knocking at a locked door, your knuckles bleeding, you do not know what prayer really is. This parable starts teaching persistence, shifts to justice, and finally to faith. The interpretation I just read certainly captures all those themes. So let's dive in now and look more deeply at this parable to find how God may speak to us today. Parables are known to use characters to represent larger groups of people or societal conditions. This parable begins with two characters. First, the unjust judge. For Luke's audience, he appears to be like a paid magistrate, probably hired and appointed by Herod or the Romans. Popularly, they would call him Diana Geselot. I had to get my Greek in there somewhere. Which means robber judge. Unless one had influence or money to bribe, there was little hope you'd get a verdict in your favor. The woman, a widow, is the symbol of the poor, the defenseless, the oppressed of their time. She had no influence, no resources, no way to win the judge's favor. But she had a weapon, persistence. And in the end of the day, her persistence won. Who hasn't, from time to time, given in to persistence? Please, 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 may I go? May I stay? Can I have? Please, please, please. Does that sound familiar? This judge could not take the widow's persistence pleading for justice. And in the original Greek, the word translated here as bother literally means to give somebody a black eye. It wasn't just she was bugging the living daylights out of him. She was doing it in such a way as to damage his reputation. It was embarrassing. So the judge's decision to grant justice was not for justice sake, but for the sake of his reputation. Then the parable presents a comparison of the unjust, unjust God uh, I'm sorry, the unjust, corrupt judge to God. If a cruel judge will give way to the unrelenting pressure of the widow, how much more will God listen to the prayers of the saints? This parable presents prayer as continual and persistent, repeating petitions against long periods of silence. Many of us know too well the human experience of prayer as one of delay, while we are left to acknowledge the mystery of God's ways. Perhaps are we, the petitioner, being hammered out through long days and nights of prayer into a vessel that will be able to hold the answer that will come. I don't know. The Danish theologian Soren Kierkegaard said, prayer doesn't change God, but changes him who prays. I've spent decades with some of my personal prayers, decades, you can't see the gray hairs, but truly decades. And these prayers have evolved, they've been redirected, but the basic requests remain. I have been discouraged and I have thought to abandon the petitions, but eventually they work their way back into my prayers. In the past few years, I have been working with people whose struggles have been hard and painful, addiction, physical illness, poverty, injustice, homelessness. 
incarceration. But their prayers are persistent, and their faith is steeped in hope. Mahatma Gandhi said of prayer, prayer is not asking. Prayer is a longing of the soul. We might sometimes hear this parable as a reassurance that God is prepared to give us anything we ask for persistently. I considered that, but I came away confused. I know of many prayers that appear to go unanswered. So what is Luke trying to tell us here? Jesus doesn't say that every persistent prayer is answered. He speaks of one of the three great gifts God wants to give us. The gifts are the Holy Spirit, justice, and the kingdom. And here we learn about the gift of justice. We are asked to be participants in bringing about justice by being persistent and continuous in prayer. While the parable is framed by references to prayer and faith, the emphasis in verses 3 to 8 on justice and how it figures in the conflict between the vulnerable justice seeker and the unjust power holder. The powerful and just God takes the place of the unjust judge and in the end, granting justice to the vulnerable, the chosen ones who cry to him day and night. That's right. There's only one other use in Luke of this term, the chosen one, and that's in chapter 23, verse 35, when Jesus is on the cross being mocked by the religious leaders. God's chosen one. Then the chosen one on the cross cries out, as the chosen ones are said to cry out here, day and night. It is a different verb in Greek, but the effect in the scripture is the same. The parable ends with a question that reaches beyond the cross, beyond the tomb, beyond the resurrection, into the future. And yet when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? So a beginning of the answer to that question appears to be that the Son of Man will find faith, but it may be in unexpected places, as it often has been in the gospel not among the religious professionals or the ones certain of their own righteousness, but among the outsider, the unlovely, the unclean, the ones certain of their sinfulness. So what does this mean for you and me today? It doesn't feel like in our society, in the greater world, much has changed when we hear the news from around the world and hear in our own backyard, corrupt power, oppressed people, wars, poverty, suffering, these haven't gone away. And I know people around the world are praying continuously for justice and peace. But perhaps Paul, how Paul instructs Timothy today can help us understand what we are to do. Timothy must persevere be persistent in the faith and teach others to do likewise by passing along the instructions he has received. By passing along the instructions we have received. But notice, this does not mean that this gives Timothy a license to berate, or steamroll. The imperatives to convince, rebuke, and encourage are followed by to teach with the utmost patience. Timothy, one hopes, understands that this is being something other than a boombox. Do y'all remember a boombox? I don't know. Ben, do you know what a boombox? Way to go. Ben knows. The boombox blaring 
receive teachings over and over again without regard to how others hear them. But whether by word, deed, or by prayer, Christians cannot effectively bear witness to Christ's good news without careful attention and to and deep respect for their audiences. So today we focus on prayer. And I think there are plenty of us here who have an attention problem with prayer. I mean, I can start praying, I wander off, my thoughts go into a whole new conversation, I stop, I come back, and I'm like, oh no, God, where was I? Then I draw a breath, and I'm back in conversation with God. But I realize, as Victor Hugo said, even certain thoughts are prayers. These are moments, there are moments when whatever be the attitude of the body, the soul is on its knees. And over, over time, I have come to know that my thoughts are often my prayers. And my prayers are led by my faith. And every day, I hope to show my faith is who I am. Building a consistent and persistent prayer life is a process that requires practice until we come to a place where praying becomes easy, a natural thing. God does not expect you to dive into the ocean and swim from one continent to another. Not right away, maybe later, not now. But do we really think we can experience integration of our spirit, heart, and mind with an erratic prayer life? No. We need to develop intimacy by regularly and purposefully spending time in the presence of God. I know life today is hectic, and it may feel difficult setting time aside for prayer, but persistence is the name of the game here. Keep trying, keep at it, and you will find it becomes a natural part of your day. Prayer, especially long and persistent prayer, has a way of bringing peace and calm to chaos. Prayer changes a person. You may notice less agitation in traffic. You may be able to endure the petty frustrations of work, home, school, church. You may find you listen better, more intently. You will begin to think more with love. So perhaps one more quote might be useful. Positive thoughts and prayer have been the best means available since the beginning of time to transform darkness to light. That was said by Yusuf Islam, or you may know him as Cat Stevens. So just to recap, if you're worried or wondering, am I working in God's will? Am I doing God's work? I tell you today, if you pray, even for a few minutes every day, for justice, for peace, for compassion. You are working in God's will. You are working for God's kingdom. And know that prayer changes you, and it changes the people around you. And finally, prayer nurtures your faith. So that that question that Jesus asked at the end of the parable is answered by those of us who pray. Now, I've spoken about some pretty heavy things here today, so let me leave you with this story. Many stories have been told about Mother Teresa and her years of work among the poorest in Calcutta, and her many trips to raise awareness and money for the cause. In a sermon on this passage, the preacher Tom Long once told of a time when Mother Teresa was in New York City. 
She was there to meet the president and vice president of a very large company. Before the meeting, however, the two executives had privately agreed that they would not give her any money. Eventually, the diminutive Mother Teresa arrived and was seated across from the two men, separated by a very large desk. They listened to her plea, but then said, we appreciate what you do, but just cannot commit any funds at this time. Let us pray, Mother Teresa said. She then asked God to soften the hearts of these men, and after saying amen, she renewed her plea, and they renewed their answer that they were not going to commit to any money. Let us pray, she said yet again, at which point the executive relented and asked for the checkbook. And on that, on that note, I ask you to remember Commitment Sunday on October 30th. Amen. <laughs>